Welcome to All About Almodovar, an introduction to loving the films of Pedro Almodovar. I'm Ingu Kang, a critic at The Hollywood Reporter, and back with me is Slate podcast producer, Daniel motherfucking Schrader. Hey, Ingu, how's it going? (laughs) It's going okay. So we started this podcast with two of Almodovar's best known and most highly regarded films. Today, we're going to go one year back from Woman on the Verge of a Nervous Breakdown to 1987's Law of Desire, which has been described as Almodovar's most autobiographical work. Oh, Pedro. (laughs) Uh, And it's also the movie that the director himself has called the key film in my life and my career. It is also supposed to be the best encapsulation of his view on desire, which we know is a concept that he's obsessed with because he named his production company Desire, El Deseo. Like Woman on the Verge, Law of Desire also stars Antonio Banderas and my thin-lipped goddess Carmen Maura. You gotta get that representation where you can. Yes. (laughs) But the protagonist of this film is a director, played by Eusebio Poncello, that Almodovar invites direct comparisons to. Poncello's successful gay director is named Pablo, which is, of course, similar to Pedro. And Pablo has a trans sister named Tina, who sh- shares a sound in her name with Almodovar's own brother, Agustin. Antonio Banderas plays a character named Antonio Benitez, who, in perhaps a bit of fan fiction, is in love with and obsessed with Pedro. I mean, Pablo. Law of Desire was also the first film made within Pedro Almodovar and his brother Agustin's production company. They had trouble getting the film funded, with one potential investor saying that there was no story. <laughs> so sure. with that said, Daniel, summarize Law of Desire for us. I would love to talk to that funder who did not think there was enough or any story in this, because it's... It's dizzying to try and figure out a summary for this film. Um, It's like a seven-year soap opera condensed into a two-hour movie. And completely lost in its own timeline. Uh, I have no idea ever when anything is happening or how long has passed from scene to scene. Basically, it is about Pablo and his sister Tina and an obsessive fan who wants to insinuate himself into Pablo's life in any way he can. So... I think it'd just be good to start from the opening scene of the film, which is actually the final scene of Pablo's latest movie. (laughs) Uh, Describe the scene for us. Well, it is uh, a young man getting naked in a bedroom alone while a film director stands off screen and instructs him to take off his clothes and start... Uh, touching himself and and i think the important thing is that the director basically first appears only as a disembodied voice and he even says don't look at me yes it's highly voyeuristic and it's sort of this like encapsulation of what being a director is you sort of have this godlike control telling people what to do and what you hope is that someone is so attracted to what is there on screen that they might want to even mimic the action of what they see in their own lives, which is exactly what we see because as soon as the scene is over, you see a very hot Antonio Banderas rush to the bathroom in the movie theater and basically jerk himself off while repeating lines from the movie that he just saw. It was actually such a thrilling opening to a movie because, I mean, I've definitely seen that sex scene play out plenty of times in porn. But before he gets to the bathroom, we have maybe the most 80s opening title card I've ever experienced with a sound sting that I thought was a George Michael song at one point. Because it's just so, like, 80s saxophony, like, I'm going to go to Miami and wear pastels and electric colors and just have a lot of drug sex sign me up by the way but god we're not even five minutes in yet all right so daniel summarize in exactly one minute all of the crazy things that happen in the rest of the movie go 
Oh, God. Okay, so Pablo and Juan uh, go back to Pablo's apartment and say goodbye to each other as Juan's going off to his sister's village to help her with something. And so then that Pablo demands a like very psychotic letter from him that causes other problems. Antonio uh, creeps into Pablo's life and uh, kind of takes over and forces Pablo to love him, grows jealous of Juan and ends up trying to go and make Juan have sex with him and then murders him. When Juan, when Pablo finds out that uh, Antonio has murdered Juan, Pablo ends up crashing his car and getting amnesia while all this is happening. 20 seconds. While all this is happening, uh, Pablo's sister, Tina, who is a transgender woman, uh, is raising her girlfriend's daughter, Ada, is in a play that her brother is producing and is upset at her brother for making a movie that is about her life without her permission and uh, ends up getting held hostage by Antonio at Pablo's apartment at the end. And then Antonio shoots himself after Pablo and Antonio have sex together while everybody else waits outside. Okay. It was a little more than 60 seconds, but I'll allow it. Great. Now, let's get into it. Daniel, did you like this movie? (sighs) I don't know. I loved how horny it was. And I loved how dense it was. But I don't know if I liked it. Because it just feels too loose, too... I, and I think maybe it's because you have spoiled me with his best work so far, but it just feels like he needed an editor. It felt like an early work, like he was still making a pastiche of other people's voices as opposed to having found his own. I think he finds his own in Women on the Verge. And it's very interesting, actually, to me that uh, he's so obsessed with this play the human voice and um that in this movie where i still think he hasn't found his own he's like staged a production of this play that he's obsessed with and then but finally the film that gives him the ability to find his own voice is taking a step past other people's work and Uh, like appropriating it yes exactly so i think we can basically really squarely place this in the genre of a gay melodrama, right? The movie sort of is about this obsessive relationship, and eventually there's like a very predictable murder where Antonio eventually, played by Antonio Banderas, eventually goes to that seaside town where Juan works and kills him out of jealousy. And then the movie eventually ends when both Pablo and Antonio are back in the city and they're they like after like a lot of like convolution they end up in this police hostage situation and they fuck one last time and Antonio is like well I finally possessed you so now I'm going to kill myself and then the movie ends with this like pieta scene where Pablo is holding Antonio in his hands and that's sort of like the final scene of the movie and I feel like let me read this quote that Almodovar has said it deals with my vision of desire something that's both very hard and very human by this I mean the absolute necessity of being desired and the fact that in the interplay of desires it's rare that two desires meet and correspond And it's such a pessimistic look on love that it's sort of hard to get behind. And it's not that, like, I demand a more rosier vision of love. It's just that it feels very fatalistic in, like, a very adolescent, cynical way. I think it sounds decidedly gay. How so? I I think that... And of course, I'm coming from this as a single gay man who has not been in a significant relationship and you're a married straight woman, so you have much more knowledge about long-term relationships. But I do think that, uh, especially in the 80s and before when he was coming up, the idea of like a gay relationship has no sort of attachment to the idea of traditional um, relationship roles. And so these types of intergenerational 
love connections are much more common in gay situations than they are in straight ones. And I also think that gay men are much more willing to create separations in their lives of who they love, how they love, and what and how sex fits into love in their life. Even if it is cynical, I like it because it isn't the traditional. I I I want it in a way. Even if I want more than that, I I want that type of long-term love connection for sure, but at the same time, I want those non-traditional things because they're more exciting, more interesting, more alluring. But I got to say, my whole finding out that this is the most autobiographical work of his, I just have to wonder what obsessed fan of his is sitting at home thinking, "Ugh, this movie's about me." <laughs> well, Pedro hold me when I have killed myself. <laughs> exactly. Well, because this whole movie is about a fan who's just gone crazy. It's he never even actually loved uh, Pablo. He loved what he do- what he did. He loved the idea of him. He loved that. Uh, he was this break from tradition. Antonio comes from a very traditional household. I think his dad is a politician. Um, I believe you told me that his mom's German. Yeah. And so he comes from like a very conservative home, and sorry, it we seems should, we should uh, clarify Antonio the character, not Antonio the real life person. I mean, I love that because I gotta wonder like. It was early Antonio Banderas as dumb as like a Tony Danzo where the character had to be named Antonio because he just wouldn't he wouldn't <laughs> respond if it wasn't his name. Wow. I mean, you cast Antonio in this role because you get to make him naked for the whole movie, not because he can act, though he can. So one thing I find really fascinating is that Almodovar basically claims credit for discovering Antonio Banderas. He says, like, basically, he had, like, just come to Madrid from his hometown of Malaga, uh, which I believe is where Pablo Picasso is also from, from the south of Spain. Anyway, he's in this, like, tiny role in a play that Almodovar sees and basically says, that guy is a movie star, and basically just starts casting him in stuff. But the thing I find really notable is that they've done eight movies together now, and Pedro Almodovar knows fully well what Antonio Banderas looks like. He's just, like, the hottest man. And basically, Pedro Almodovar constantly casts him in these, like, really vicious, mean roles. I, I mean, we all know those straight guys that we love to be mean to us. <laughs> Last week, we talked about Woman on the Verge. He was a complete fuckboy. Uh, in this one, he is basically a murderer. In He's the previous- like literally the talented Mr. Ripley. Yes, but like a much dumber version. Well, than- yeah. Yes. The movie that Almodovar made right before Law of Desire, Matador, also featured Antonio Banderas playing a rapist. The movie we're going to talk about next week, Tie Me Up, Tie Me Down, he plays a rapist and a kidnapper. And in basically... His biggest role until Pain and Glory in The Skin I Live In, he plays a sociopathic surgeon. And so I think it's really great that Almodovar can sort of see like the character actor inside Antonio Banderas' smoking hot looks. But at the same time, he rarely gets these like good guy roles. And like when he plays the bad guys, they're not written with like a lot of nuance which I find very interesting. Did you like this as a gay romance, though? Because I feel like I probably did not. I mean, I got swept up in it at times for sure, but it definitely left me f- wanting. I I think the real romance is like a familial one, actually, between Pablo and his sister, Tina. That's like the love I was the most interested in. Yeah. 
I agree. And I think that one of the other reasons why the gay romance didn't work for me is that the actor who plays Pablo is so cold and so intellectual that it's sort of hard to get a sense of Pedro Almodovar as like that guy. He's this weird egghead. He does not seem really all that sexy. And also, Almodovar said in this interview that he wasn't really happy with that performance either because apparently he really wanted Pablo to play like a character who, when he does cocaine, like really gets into cocaine. And according to Almodovar, the actor was taking other drugs that prevented him from being like the Pablo that Pedro wanted. So... Almodovar was not impressed. I was not impressed. Well, it sounds like Pedro should have just done the role himself then. <laughs> he did throw himself in the movie. You did see him, right? Oh, I did not. Yeah. Oh, it's just like a he's actually uncredited. I looked it up, but um he is the like shopkeeper working when Antonio goes out to buy supplies to fix up Pablo's home. Oh. At the hardware yeah. store. Exactly. Oh. And I know we need to, I know I want to talk about Tina and stuff, but I think this is an interesting place to talk about desire because uh, Antonio is obsessed with Pablo. He is desperate to be a part of his life in any way. The like movie he saw was, it seems like a gay awakening or something. And so Pablo probably means more to him than just who Pablo is, which is, part of the reason why pablo never actually falls in love with him is because he could tell that like oh you don't love me you love what i make you love like the thing that you think of as me and i'm sure the feelings that i accidentally stirred in you right and i'm sure that that's a very real experience that pedro himself had but what's interesting here is that antonio is so desperate to do to become a part of his life that he like does all this research at one point he watches a tv show where Pablo is being interviewed by a um, daytime talk show host played by Rossi De Palma, actually. And who Almodovar uh, says he also discovered. He's just discovering him left and right, isn't he? <laughs> he's next. He's going to say he discovered Carmen Mauro while she was working for twenty years before he started working. With her. <laughs> but um, anyway, so in that scene, Rossi De Palma's character is asking Pablo, like, "Oh, what do you what do you want in a lover? What are you looking for?" and Pablo lists all these things that are like, oh, yeah, of course, I'm looking for a guy who will like clean, take care of everything, not go partying with me, will just like keep the home and everything. And so Antonio's like, great, I'm going to do that. I'm going to I'm going to move in and there's no way he's going to get rid of me. So he's like becomes this just handyman fixing up things around the house, things like that, trying to be the thing that he thought pablo wanted but i have to say this was like the one point where i could relate to pablo because my husband always says like oh i'm not really sure if you want a husband or a butler and i'm always like why not both see i could relate to antonio in this moment (laughs) because i have certainly been the person who's like well if i can if if i can just do all the things then you must love me right um but then I so quickly jump into Pablo's shoes because what I said I want isn't what I want. And you should know that. <laughs> Was there any point at which you were taken by the romance of like that relationship? Yes. <laughs> you said that so reluctantly. Because... Guiltily. Well... For so much of it, I don't understand why it's still happening. Like, why did Pablo keep writing letters to Antonio after he left? Like, why did he let this go on? He could have just stopped writing. Just ghost the dude. It's not that hard. It must have been easier to ghost people back in the day, I can imagine. So, like, also, like, why does he tell Antonio, like, I'm leaving you. I'm going to go find Juan and we're going to be happy to just like 
tell Antonio, like, here's the plan, so you should go murder this guy so that I can't love him. It, like, <laughs> that was a whole weird thing. But the only time that I really bought their relationship or their love or whatever it was is when Antonio puts on Lo Dudo right at the end yes. and is singing it to him right before he dies. Lo Dudo. So lo dudo means like I I doubt it, right? And I think the lyrics are some the gist of the song is something like I doubt that you will ever love me as much as I love you, but like it's a love song anyway. Which summarizes essentially like the movie, uh, but also it's. I I think there's something deeply romantic and almost altruistic about that kind of self-sacrificing love. Oh, I agree. I I think that. I mean, I was listening to that song as our uh, recording started because I just was so entranced by it. It. I think I love that because it feels like the fir- the only time that Antonio is really honest about the state of their relationship. Yeah. And really accepts it, but knows that like he has no, there is no e- other end for him. And that like he has accepted that this is the, like that this is the end of his love story and that is the way it had to end. But he's okay because of the hour he gets to spend with this man that, he loves or has convinced himself he loves and i think that textually at least i think that honesty and that self-sacrifice is what gets pablo to finally love him back but by that point antonio has killed himself and so again yeah. there's a sort of like mismatched scheduling of affections i think it's also part of that pablo realizes that he just lost this love that he didn't that he didn't want but was so like was so available to him that he like he is part of the reason that this love is that this per that this person is dead is because of his unwillingness to give is there a name for that in the gay world i i if i knew it then i would be able to talk to my therapist about it (laughs) So I think we can basically agree that, like, the most interesting character in this movie is Tina. No question. We actually find out a lot about her story, and we don't ever really find out much about Pablo's. And she has a crazy fucking story. Yeah. Carmen Maurer gets this fantastic monologue near the end after her brother Pablo has suffered from amnesia, which we haven't even gotten to yet. But she has this beautiful (laughs) monologue where she gets to recount her entire like history and I loved it and it seems like it's the only character that he cared about that much to get into I also got that feeling I wonder if part of that is actually because it is the least personal you say that but here's the thing so one of the first things that we learn about Tina is that she's played by a cisgender actress but she's a transgender character and she and Ada go into this church like in an early scene. And basically, Tina talks to a priest and says something like, oh, do you remember me, father? And they're at an all-boys school. And the priest... Well, is- actually, he the pre- she walks in and starts singing. And the priest says, oh, wow, you have a beautiful voice, like this boy who used to be here. And she was like, guess what? That's me. <laughs> First of all, very awkward. Uh, second of all... It's implied that the priest actually sexually assaulted or molested. I mean, it's not even implied. It is straight up like, I've loved two men in my life, you and my dad. Yes. And the really crazy part is, number one, this is like the premise of like a whole other movie that we are going to discuss, Bad Education. Number two, Almodovar got pilloried by the Spanish press when this movie came out for saying that it was too autobiographical. But he says there's only two autobiographical elements actually in this movie. One being like this crazy letter that Pablo sends 
Juan, where he says something like, oh, like your love letters to me aren't interesting enough. Here's one I've actually written for you. Just sign your name and then return it back to me. And then two... Which is like like what everybody should do. That's genius. (laughs) I'm going to start dictating all of my lover's letters back to me. That's just how it's going to work. I can't see how that might backfire on you in any way. And then the second thing that he says he pulled from his life is like this sort of revelation. And we know that Almodovar went to a kind of boarding school in order to become a priest. And then he decided very much, I am not going to become a priest. I'm not exactly sure what he meant when he said that this sort of quasi-confessional scene with the priest is autobiographical. He said in interviews for Bad Education, which takes this exact same premise and turns it into a feature-length movie, that he himself wasn't sexually assaulted by the priests, but that there was a child who was, and everyone knew who that child was. Wow, I, I didn't realize that, but helps me also understand the... Uh his interest in exploring sexual assault stories, for sure. So I think the other really interesting thing about Tina is that she has two main storylines. So one is that she has become the de facto mother of this little girl uh, who is actually the daughter of her ex. And her ex is actually a cisgender woman who is played by a transgender actress, Bibi Fernandez who's credited as B.B. Anderson here. And the other storyline is that Pablo is writing a script based on her life, and she really hates this idea. And so this extremely tight brother and sister uh, finally have a lot of revelations as a result of him basing a script off of her life, which she really dislikes. I I mean, I know you said that there are only two things that are very much like from his personal life, but I'd be curious how much, how if he's had to have these discussions with his brother. Or his two sisters. Oh, he has two sisters as well? Yeah. Then I'm sure that that's also tied up in it. Um, But, huh, I didn't know that. But I think what's really interesting about Tina is that she's very wounded and at the same time she's really just confident and self-assured and she really veers back and forth between those two polarities a lot. One of my favorite scenes in this movie is this like crazy completely over the top scene where Tina, Pablo, and the little girl are walking down like a summer street in Madrid and Tina suddenly decides she's really hot. They see this like random man like hosing down the street and she says, hose me down. And like while the man just like pummels her with water, she's like having a whole Marilyn Monroe moment. She just gets into the fantasy of that moment and it's this like wonderful depiction of someone who is really grabbing life at like whatever she can grab. But then there are such like beautiful moments of insecurity that pop out as well. So uh, like when she and Pablo go into the back of this restaurant to do drugs together, the first thing she says to him is don't tell me that I'm overacting in front of other people. And uh, like just this very clearly insecure of like, we're having fun, haha, laughing in front of everybody. But then as soon as we're behind closed doors, like, how dare you say that about me? Or <laughs> my, my personal favorite uh, insecurity, which is when she and Ada are in bed together after uh, Ada's mother has cleaned out their apartment of stuff. And I don't know if she just like stole it all or it was actually hers or what, but they're sitting in these two Betty Boop shirts, which we need to get ourselves some Betty Boop shirts. So when we go on vacation, we can be them. But uh, they have this lovely scene together. And then at one point, as it's ending, uh, Ada says, I love you. And Car- and Tina says, Mucho? <laughs> and it's just the 
the just the the faint up in that word is so <laughs> it highlights why Carmen Maurer is such a perfect actress, but also like why Tina is such a fragile woman. <laughs> I I think it's sort of like important to note also that while Carmen Maura became super beloved among a lot of the queer community in Spain for this particular role. I think something that probably felt super transgressive at the time is that here is a trans woman who also is a better mother than a biological mother. Um, But I've also been reading, while we've been doing this, podcast, a book by Paul Julian Smith called Desire Unlimited about the films of Pedro Almodovar. And he posits that Almodovar doesn't actually care that much about trans representation beyond sort of like the idea of transgression. And I think that if I'm looking at this role, if I'm looking at the trans women in All About My Mother, I feel like that really tracks. He doesn't, he, I think, seldom casts actual trans actors in these trans roles. And so it feels very much like here is like another way I'm going to like thumb my nose at society. And I'm going to express sympathy for these people I feel an affinity with, but also I'm not really getting into their heads per se. I think that Tina is someone, Tina is a character who is ultimately extremely like lovable, but you only really see her from the outside as opposed to the inside. She says that like her father wanted her to become a woman. He just liked the idea. And so we never really get a sense of how Tina herself really feels about being a woman. We presume that she likes it because she's kept with it. But at the same time, we never get a sense of like her purest unadulterated desires about her own gender identity. She's almost saying like it's unknowable because this is just who she is and this is who where her like this is where her life went and she can't she can almost not think of ha- not having done it. Even if it wasn't what she wanted, it's what she maybe it is what she wanted and maybe it, this is all about desire again of did she really desire this was did she just do this because of the desire that she had for her father and was trying to be what he wanted i think that that's part of the tricky thing about desire is figuring out like what desire is actually yours and what is just the desire you're acquiring for other people Now that we're at the end of the show, let's do our closing segment, ranking the movies that we've discussed so far. Great. Uh, I'll go first since uh, you did last time. Um, it's a tough one. but um, <laughs> Is it? No, it's not. I mean, <laughs> my ranking from last week, if we remember, is Women on the Verge is first, followed by All About My Mother. And... Though it pains me to say, because of the amount of skin I got to see of Antonio, it's got to be third. Yeah. I ranked All About My Mother first last week, sticking with that, and then The Woman on the Verge, and sorry, Pedro Almodovar's personal manifesto last. Personal man-ifesto. Thanks. That was highly necessary. Yes. Uh, well, I mean, hey, going forward, all we've got is woman festos. So what can we say? <laughs> Thank you for joining us here on All About Almodovar. If you'd like to send us a message, our email is allaboutalmodovar at gmail.com. Next week, we'll be discussing 1990s Tie Me Up, Tie Me Down with June Thomas. Until then, I'm Daniel Schrader. I will be Ingu King. And we'll talk to you next week. <laughs>